Hey everyone, Joe Axman here. And in this video, I want to look at the aspect called inconjunct. Um, so what is an inconjunct? Um, as far as I, I know, I haven't come across any really great explanations. Uh, people get kind of mystical woo woo with the inconjunct aspect, mostly because they don't understand it. So they project onto it, all kinds of things. Like you'll see like um, people talking very fancifully about the yod, the magical yod. But, um, you know, and the thing about uh, astrology is that it lends itself to all kinds of fancy nonsense that doesn't really amount to anything, but people can, you know, imagine that it applies and yod is like the magical fingers of God. Okay. Um, anyway, this isn't so much about the yod, but this is just about the inconjunct and that uh, you can apply it to yods, but th this is not, uh, maybe I'll make another video one day about the yod, but first we need to understand what is the in conjunct uh, aspect, which is also the queen conks 150 degrees, or um, it's, um, what, five twelves and seven twelves, I guess. Yeah, it's like that. Any case, um, all right, first off, just basically what it what is it? Um, I'm gonna have to share my screen. Just so we can get a better understanding. And this is my chart. And the reason I um starting off with my chart, I have different examples. We'll go over some different examples, but I want to start off with my chart because I know myself best and it's easiest to explain it uh, to my own experience first and foremost. I mean. It's great to use celebrities, but one of the things that we don't get with celebrities is an up close and personal look. We're looking at their public life, which is can be quite different from somebody's private life. We're not going into their home. We're not getting an in you know depth glimpse at their their you know their struggles, their their issues, their problems, their emotions, things like that. We only see what they want us to see mostly, right? Uh, so I can give you a, a bit more in depth. Um, uh, perspective if I use my own charts. And I have two inconjuncts here, strong ones, both tied to the nodes. Uh, but still it applies. And I know that it applies because I can look at my own life and make sense of it. All right, so first off we have, in order to understand the inconjunct, we have to look at the opposition. And I know in classical astrology, they'll say opposition has a Saturnian quality because of the theme of Mundi where uh, Cancer and um, Cancer and Leo are the are house the two luminaries, the Moon and the Sun, and opposite them are the house the signs ruled by Saturn. Therefore, the opposition is Saturnian, and that's a very naive uh, interpretation, if you ask me. In a very literal sense, the opposition is is a relationship because if we look at the natural zodiac with Aries at the helm. Uh, my my uh, natal chart does not have Aries at the helm, but let's just imagine it does. Aries at the helm, the opposite will be Libra. Oppositions are relationships. Um, the starting point is the self, the opposition is the other. So these are equal relationships. And that's the first point to understand and understanding what the Queen Kunks or in conjunct aspect is. Again, this symbol here is the Queen Kunk or in conjunct, and it means one sign away from opposition. Right, we're either talking about a sixth house or an eighth house relationship. If, um, and we always have to relate it back to Aries or the natural zodiac. That's how we get the understanding of what these relationships mean. So, um, again, oppositions will be seventh house relationships. That would be equal partnerships, right? Where you have like a contract, a deal, you're in agreement. It's a handshake, right? You know, there's some sort of uh, legality or officiality or um, equality uh, defined by opposition. So they're not necessarily bad, right? You know, there's some give and take. There's some uh, push pull. Um, you know, people want to say open enemy. I don't know if I believe that or agree with that. Um, it's really just about relationships and that relationships challenge us. They're not always easy, but they're necessary and we love them anyway, right? And these are equal relationships. And that's the best, that's not, I don't want to say the best kind of relationship because there's many different kinds of relationships, but it's like, you know, if you're going to have a relationship, ideally we'd want it to be equal, right? 
I'm sure some people want to dominate over others, but those people who are being dominated don't like that so much. All right, then we have the two other relationship houses, which would be naturally the sixth house or the Virgo house and the natural zodiac. And in the sixth house, we have a service to other kind of relationship where we're working for others. This is this is the kind of relationship where it's uh, employee versus boss. This is why naturally the sixth house relates to work situations like jobs where you're in service to your boss, you're in service to your employer, right? Employer, employee, employer. You're, here you're the employee, you're serving others, you're working for others. Um, this can also be competitive in the sense of like fighting and whatnot. That's the other side of the sixth house where you're fighting for your up and comings, right? You're the underdog fighting for the championship. Um, so that that is the, the fighty side of the sixth house, but mostly it deals with mundane, um, nose to the grindstone, hard work. Health is another issue that can come up here. There are many, many things, but essentially sixth house is about an unequal relationship where you're coming underneath somebody else. You're in service to, um, you know, in a sense, there's a less than quality with the sixth house. The, the, the nice aspect of the sixth house is that ego is very diminished in the sixth house, right? Because you can, when you're, when you're uh, an underling, which is essentially what the sixth house relates to mundane activities, being an underling, being an employer, um, employee, sorry. Um, there's no, there's, you have to, you know, your ego gets squashed. You can't really deal with ego pretty much. You can't bring ego to the table with the sixth house because you know, if you do, you get fired. If you come to your boss with ego, there's like, you don't give me the, all the mundane crap. I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to sit back and, you know, man, whatever, lead or whatever. And your boss will be like, no, you're fired. I got somebody else to do your job because you're replaceable, right? So you can't bring ego to the table in the sixth house. In any case, um, this is a relationship house and it is a representation of the in conjunct to the ascendant. Um, and that is one aspect. The other aspect would be the eighth house aspect which is also in conjunct um to the ascendant and or the natural zodiac aries um and this is about relationships where you have power and control over the other right uh this is more like employer versus employee here you can be the boss here you can be the teacher here you can be the leader or e even you can be play a criminal element right where like the mafia, oh, got to pay the maf, got to pay the, you know, got to pay the mafia for my protection or whatever, however it goes. I'm you know, not really involved in that kind of world, but um, yeah, uh, criminality, um, dominatrix, you know, like dominatrix, that's a very uh, eighth house scorpionic thing, um, dom, submissive, whatever. Um what else? Just power control and and oh, also like sex is very much an eighth house thing. Obviously, we know that um, sex should be mutual and and um, uh, what's the word agreed upon. However, uh, there is something interesting about this: is that when we talk about the eighth house uh, or when we talk about sex, the um, um, slang word for sex is fuck, right? And what is the connotation of, of getting fucked? Well, that's very much an eighth house thing where somebody is dominating you and controlling you. It's not exactly equal. When you say, I got fucked, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, you're having some sort of equality going on. Or um, if the opposite, you say, I fucked someone. Um, it's kind of like a, a dominating, I fucked him, I fucked her. Um, I, I'm just projecting here. I don't fuck him. But anyway um or i fucked him over right um it has a very dominating quality to it where one person is taking charge or in control or power not like controlling the other um in a very um dominating way and here i mean if we're talking about fighting this is also in a sense it does the eighth house and sixth house have a parallel in that um if we're fighting in the eighth house, we're fighting as the champ. We're fighting as the heavyweight champion. The eighth house Scorpio is the it's the one who already holds the belt. They're not the contender. They're not the up and comer. 
that would be the sixth house Virgo type. Um, we're fighting for dominance. We're fight we already have the belts. We're already the heavyweight champion of the world, and we're fighting to maintain it, right? And we might lose it occasionally. I mean, that's one of the things that can happen in the eighth house is that we lose our kingship status. I don't want to say kingship. That's more like Leo, maybe uh, just heavyweight, heavyweight champ. Eighth house, eighth house Scorpio is the heavyweight champ, right? Um, and then it goes through its death, you know, shedding its skin, its rebirth. And that's all sort of, you know, the akin to losing losing the title belt to a contender. You know, that's when Virgo can step in and knock out the heavyweight champ of Scorpio or eighth house. In any case, uh, this in conjunct represents the other side of relationships of power and control. So when we when we're talking about in conjunct, we can we can apply this and say that there's there's an unequal relationship with any in conjunct where one side is dominating the other. One side is playing an eighth house role, the other side is playing a sixth house role. And you might be like, okay, well, it's it's Virgo, it's it's Aries to Virgo or Aries to Scorpio, not um not uh Scorpio to Virgo, but but in actuality, when it's it's always one one side being dominant and one side being submissive, one side being um employer one side being employee and it can switch right but when you have equal relationships they're they're the same when you have unequal relationships one person is in charge the other person is subservient to that person right if we're just talking about individuals right but then it can switch so in essence the in conjunct is a seesaw has a seesaw effect where the energy is sliding to one side and then it's sliding to the other and when it's sliding to one side, all the energy is, is focused on that side, and the other side gets depleted or diminished, or like it's starved for energy. Um, and then it's reversed um, periodically. So you can see a lot of, you know, kind of almost schizophrenic behavior with ink adjuncts, where, where, where the person's going to one side very strongly, and then they switch and go to the other side very strongly. Um, Versus the opposition will be much more balanced, right? Uh, squares will be different. There'll be much more of a constant fighting, constant struggle, right? It's not so much the seesaw effect, right? But that's what's unique about the inconjunct is that it has this seesaw effect. Um, and related to my chart, see, we could we could see, okay, south node to Neptune in conjunct. Uh, south node act is activated first half of life. And Neptune here would relate to um, you have to look at the dignities and the relationship with each other. Um, Neptune and Sag is, is pretty good. Um, it's very epic kind of creative creativity uh, because Sag is very adventurous and high-minded. Neptune is very uh, creative. Um, but the inconjunct, it definitely can bring out some negativity. It doesn't have to, but it can. Depends on what combinations are going on here. Um, and so one of the things I can say is that when I was younger, um, I mean, there always also Neptune is opposite my Venus and Sun, but that and that plays a part in it. But um, Neptune was an issue of of being very. I was very dreamy. I still am, but much more so when I was younger. Uh, dreams, fantasy, drugs, alcohol, all of these things uh, played heavily into my life. And, um, and but the in conjunct also will will create the, this tension against. Neptune. So there were periods of my life, especially as a youngin, where I completely rejected. Um, let's see, I I embraced. So I smoked a lot. I drank a lot. I didn't do any of the other drugs. I was very I drew the line there. So there was this hardship. I mean, so in my own experience, there's a there's a kind of there was a kind of hard line. And then at other times I, I smoked a lot of pot. But but you can see that there's this not there's this um, imbalanced relationship with Neptunian thing where I was rejecting it and then I was going overboard with it, right? Um, and that's the South Node. That's young. So that's as a youngin. And it, maybe it translates to Jupiter. Um, you know, you, I could say like if I was in my Jupiter, then I was being more philosophical and relationship oriented and try, really trying to resist this Neptunian influence. Uh, but if I was in my Neptune, then it you know, perhaps it detracted from my relationships and I was maybe drinking too much, maybe 
various times smoking too much weed or whatever. Um, and that was, you know, um, creating imbalance with my relations when I was younger. Now, as I'm older, I don't really seem to have that problem. Like I'm not, I don't drink to excess. I don't do any drugs. Um, you know, if, you know, not to get too personal or detailed, but I'm very moderate, right? I'm very moderate. I just don't have a problem with that. I don't want it. It's not an issue. I was when I was younger. I really drank a lot and, you know, did some other stuff, but now it's not a problem. But I there's an issue with Venus here, uh, North Node to Venus. And now I'm more and more my North Node pulling me into my identity, myself, the creation of me as an individual, right, with, with Uranus. And it's in conjunct my Venus. Venus is my relationships. Venus is also my creativity naturally and ruling the 12th house. So creativity is, is an issue for me. And if I'm feeling really creative, then I'm, I'm sort of like being pulled away from, from myself, from my identity, from, from my, my, you know, um, my, my journey as, as an individual, right. It's detracting me from my past even though it's, it's tied to my son. So there's a, there's a, there's a conflict here and joy also. Um, so this is not very easy. So this is kind of like a, a big struggle, you know, going into myself, building my identity at the, at a huge cost of my, my leisure, my joy, my relationships, my fun, you know, Venus is all those things, my creativity, you know, happiness, having a good time. Or if I'm really into all of those things, I'm like pulled away from myself, my journey, my, my mission, my my calling, my identity, right? You know, I'm just having a good time, indulging, hanging out with friends, just getting lost, right? Plus, Venus conjunct the sun has that effect anyway. So it's it's kind of a it's, it's a difficult challenge this one, right? Plus, where Venus has no you know great benefit to um, Scorpio, it's it's actually um, uh, in detriment here. Right. And then North Node doesn't do anything for Gemini either. Well, the nodes actually do have um, some dignity with, I, I don't know. I, some people say that. In any case, regardless, we'll look at some other examples that'll make a lot more sense when it comes to like having good, good dignity. All right. Let's, uh, let's pull up some different examples. I don't want to spend too long here. Um, sorry. Let me go to the recent. Sorry, man, a little. We'll look at Adele first. Okay, so. And, and again, it's difficult to, to really pin down exactly uh, with these celebrities because we don't know them up close and personal. We just know, um, you know, what, the, what we see on the screen or whatever, what we hear. With, right. So um, she's got a, a Mercury Gemini zero degrees. So she's very, you know, she's very bright, obviously. And it's in conjunct Uranus. Uranus is conjunct Saturn. Saturn's in domicile in, in Capricorn. So, you know, this has got some dignity. Uranus and Saturn together are, it's a much more um, mature, well-rounded um, Saturn because it has an Aquarian vibe to it with Uranus influence. Um, it's, you know, got the conservative uh, structure of, of Saturn and Capricorn, but the, the freedom of Uranus as well combined. So it's kind of a unique combination, Saturn and uh, Uranus conjunct. Um, opposite mercury and so mercury is in the 12th house in gemini and uh mercury is ruling the 12th house as well as um the fourth it's the third whole sign house but the fourth cusp the ic um virgo so we say that like she likes to be creative at home intellectually like she likes to think about her creative process it's coming to her to her intellect Right, because Mercury is here. Venus also, but it's a little further away. But we're talking about Mercury specifically. Um, so home alone being creative versus um, relationships that are very um, 
Saturnian mostly because Saturn's in domicile here, but Neptune and Uranus. So it's a very creative, uh, free spirited kind of uh, Capricornian, Saturnian type relationship. Um, so we could say it's like, uh, she needs relationships, obviously. Whenever the seventh house is involved, um, the person relies on relationships to activate those planets that are in the seventh house, right? You you can, somebody might say, well, that's in the sixth house. Yeah, it's close enough to the seventh house class, but, and same whole sign house is very strongly influencing the seventh house. So she needs relationships, obviously, all kinds of relationships. Uh, Saturnian relationships can mean uh, very, like, you know, as far as romance, that these are going to be very long-term, really stable, mature relationships. But also in, in her negotiations with people, she's very much uh, an authority, a boss, a leader, you know, very Saturnian, very much like calling the shots. Um, but in a very creative, um, independent, revolutionary way, visionary um, so she likes to work with other people uh, in a creative way that's also uh, very Saturnian. So like very structured, disciplined with her at the helm, with her as the leader. Uh, but she needs to also to have her alone time. So this her creative process is twofold. Home alone, really thinking about her own you know, creativity and then working with others in a very Saturnian, Uranian, Neptunian way. So these are at odds. So she doesn't mix these two. She's not going to be very creative. She's going to be very creative in her intellectual capacity, writing, you know, at home alone, and then going to, all right, this is what I came up with. For, let's put this together, you know, band members, whatever, you know, obviously. Okay. So that's that's that. Um, it doesn't seem to be much of an issue here because these are both dignified and they're just very separate, right? So when she has clear division here. Um Let's look at another example. That's not a problem for, for Adele. It's just that she has this natural division. Here we go. Tori Amos. Um, youngins might not know her so much, but if you're an exer like I am, Corey Amos was everywhere in the 90s, playing her piano and singing weird songs. All right. Um, she's got a lot of red going on. But you can see that her north node is in conjunct Saturn. Saturn's in Aquarius in the third house. So we can see her um, singing and piano playing here. South node, second house, uh, Saturn in dignity in Aquarius and domicile. It's color with uh, Uranus in the third house. Third house would be skills of the hands. Uh, Saturn is very epic, long lasting. So, if you know, Tori Amos, it was like this. It's very long. It's very, um, yeah, I would definitely say Saturn, Saturnian, also Aquarian, because it's weird. It was weird. She's weird, but good. Like, I wasn't a fan, but I wasn't like, I didn't hate her. Anyway, who cares? It's just my opinion. But she, you know, she could just like sit there and like, play piano a lot right but as she's getting older uh there's going to be a conflict with that and then so what happened to tori amos she disappeared and i have no idea what happened to her but obviously something happened to her and um yeah um also second lord in the third house so that's quite strong but anyway north node is definitely conflictual with her dancing fingers and dancing fingers and voice and all that so she's going to have success when she's young not so much when she's older it's going to be difficult uh because you know north node is where we get pulled is where our appetite is where we need to learn and grow and hers is i mean it's in the eighth house so um you know i don't know like what she's doing these days but she's being you know the eighth house is hiding it's secretive it powers control um you know, it's a lot of things and, and, you know, it's transformative, it's evolutionary. So she's going through her own stuff, right? Um, not to say that she can't keep playing music, but it's definitely, she can definitely be pulled from it. But let's keep going. Um, Ooh. 
กับคอร์ดีบิกคาร์ดีบิ has this clear in conjunct with their moon and Venus and Pluto okay so moon is ruling the fourth house with Cancer there's a square to Cancer with her ascendant Mars and Cancer um so definitely she's a she's wild at home you know fighting and effing <laughs> trying to keep it well it's not very PG but in any case fighting and eff effing uh at home I mean Mars Mars in, in Cancer is not very um um controlled it's not a lot of self-control right but um uh there's neutral reception here between moon and mars so that's quite good but so moon moon is the heart so moon ruling our fourth house in the first it shows our ex natural expression moon in the first house always people it's gonna make great performers because they're so expressive it's like oh wearing your heart on your sleeve you're you're just showing your heart to the world right so that's one of the things that she can um you know, and and it's it's a very she's got this hypersexual, also physical, like you know, like hypersexual, but like she'll uh, fuck you up, you know, like um thing going on, but it works for her because you know it's the mutual reception where she's showing that like it's very she's making it like artistic, like very expressive. Um, but then there's this in conjunct with Venus and Scorpio, Venus ruling the seventh house, Sun and Libra. Also, poor dignity here. Seventh Lord in the eighth house means relationships are becoming intimate and sexual, and also um, dominating, and potential shared resources. We know that she had ish, like when she was young, she would take advantage of men, steal their money. That's very much related to this, um, but it doesn't make her feel good, right? Because there's this, this, this incompatibility between her how she's, you know having sexual relationships with men, maybe taking their money, you know, shared resources, destructiveness, Pluto and Scorpio. Um, but it's not, a, it's not compatible with her moon, right? Even though she likes to be a badass, there's still um, some, you know, moon is our satisfaction. Like we can't ignore that. Like moon is, moon is our heart. Moon is what we need in order to feel satisfied. So she's like, she has this tendency to be a certain way with men may not be above boards, but she's dominating men either way. But like, whether it's like, you know, legal or illegal or nice or not nice. Um, she's dominating men because seventh Lord in the eighth house. Right. Um, that can also indicate some death at different times, like death of a partner. But um, in any case, there's, there's a lot of um, a lot of potentially taking advantage or at least being a boss being a dominatrix right um but it's not satisfying to her and so if she's being really authentic to her heart then then she's being um this very expressive creative woman who's expressing this mars and cancer but in a good way because of the mutual reception here but um you know then she likes to have fun and that fun involves some sketchy things or maybe not sketchy maybe it's just like you know sleeping with men you know like just having sex a lot of sex um but it's it but there's you know there's there's definitely some conflict she's she's deeply conflicted about her own behaviors we can see that with the in conjunct and so sometimes she's going to be more um you know um bad bitch uh expression artist and then sometimes she's going to be bad bitch um really in real life <laughs> but she doesn't like it you know there's there's still a lot of conflict about that so anyway uh let's move on definitely not satisfied by it all right now we'll go to bach johann sebastian bach Okay, amazing, amazing, amazing chart. And if you have an ear for music, you will know that, that box music is like leagues and leagues above everyone else's. I mean, I'm not just saying that. He is like the Shakespeare of music. He is the, you know, I mean, he's, if you want to talk about like the most intelligent music out there, it's Bach. I just hands down, like, I mean, you know, 
you can disagree with me. That's okay. I don't care. But this is my opinion. In any case, it's probably a lot of people's opinion. But he's got this exalted sun right on the ascendant. Amazing. Right? And then he's got exalted Venus conjunct Mercury in the 12th house in Pisces. Super duper creative. Um, and then there's the in conjunct between Jupiter and Libra. So here, Jupiter rules or co-rules Pisces. Venus uh, rules Libra. So th these are bonifying each other through an in conjunct. And so how that plays out, what we can see is we can look at his music and um, listen to Bach. If you can, st I mean, if you have an ear for this kind of thing, listen to Bach and you'll hear it. Um, he builds tension and that we see in this in conjunct, right? This in conjunct is unequal relationship where you're either an employer or employee, where you're either the boss or the, the worker, where you're either the dominatrix or the, the submiss, the sub, uh, so the submissive, the, you know, like one person is dominating the other. And so there's this tension, this very strong tension, but it's resolving itself, this in conjunct because of the, because Jupiter rules uh, Pisces and, and Venus rules uh, Libra. And um, at least Venus is exalted in in Pisces. And so that's also, I mean, uh, Mercury is, is obviously um, um, in detriment and debilitated in Pisces, but it's bonified by this, very strong venus and there's some really nice trines here mars also doubly bonifying the, the the sun dignifying the sun with the trine uh it's amazing and then the pluto in the fourth it's pluto stationary pluto is also giving its um power to venus here but this this in conjunct uh, resolves itself it's tension that resolves itself because of the dignity the, the energy exchange, right? It's like a buildup and a release. And then we have this other one here where it's Sun in conjunct Saturn. And this one is less, not, not nearly as good. This one is more difficult because Saturn does not do well with Sun or and it does not do well in Aries. And Sun in Virgo is, is fine, neutral. Um, and this Saturn also is square Mars. Uh, it's in the sixth house. So this is a very hardworking Saturn. Right, it's in Virgo, it's in the sixth house. And so what we can say is that like, when sun, this exalted sun in the first house is gonna be like, when sun's in the first house, the personality is just like, a bright, it's like sun, like they are so bright. Uh, they're just all present with their personality bubbling over in their sunshine. You know, it's just big and bright and bold and, and in your face, whatever sign it is, it's in Aries. So he's just like this big, you know, ball of light, right? Normally. But then sometimes he's working hard. He's working his butt off. He's in his Saturn. And that, that sun is not there. Like, do not bother Bach when he's working. Because he will just be Saturnian, Virgo, you know, hard, snappy. Like, just, like, leave me alone. Let me work. I'm just here to work. I'm just working. Like, I'm not going to be this big ball of light that you're used to. And then he's done working. And he's been, this big ball of light, right? Again, you know, because of this seesaw effect with this. And these are not, these are not getting along so the, there's no real connection here between the sun and saturn it's either sun and aries in the first house or saturn and virgo in the sixth house he's either working his butt off or he's being a big ball of light that everyone you know loves to see and and, and listen to his music right when he's working he's working so you kind of get that there's that natural division here it's not really uh flowing very well but where here it is it's a, a flowing uh, in conjunct. It's an in conjunct that builds tension and releases. And we love that. We hear it in his music. But here it's like a dead stop. It's 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 very dramatic, this one. Either Saturn or Sun. Okay, let's move on. All right. You can tell these are all close together. Um, I was just going through one by one and found enough. So we'll look at Roseanne Barr. Um, Let's see here. Okay, South Node Mars. So Mars is in Capricorn, Mars ruling the MC. So this is her career. It's in the 12th house. So, you know, very creative. Um, let's, you know, TV. Um, usually TV, a lot of times we'll see it in the sixth house. But um, we do see that, um, you know, the sixth house is ruled by moon. Moon's in Gemini and in the fourth. So that's interesting. Um, 
you know, she was she did stand up and then she had her own sitcom, you know, also with Mars or sorry, Uranus and Six. But in any case, we can say that like she's a bit older. She's born 1952. When she was younger, uh, she's gonna have less success. This Mars is in great dignity, it's exalted, it's in the twelfth house, but because of the inconjunct with South Node, that when she was young, it was her success was gonna be a lot more hard, hard won. Um, and she didn't receive really great recognition until she was a bit older, right? Because again, you can see, you know, she's a Scorpio son, but her also her MC is in Scorpio. Um, so that means Mars ruling. Mars also ruling the third house. So her expression, her communication, um, her creative. So naturally, yeah, you can see that there's just that that tension between her her career success as a creative artist and her youthful relationships that were very Plutonian, right? She in, in when she was young, it was all about these very powerful, intense relationships. As she got older, it was much more about career and success and all that. And Roseanne, Roseanne Barr, Roseanne, the show. See, North Node in the first house, what was her show called? Roseanne, right? North Node in the first is all about building the identity, building up the individuality of, of being alone in your self. Right? All right, let's pull up the next one. John Belushi. All right. So we can see some strong inconjuncts here. We got Pluto in conjunct Venus. Venus and Jupiter and Capricorn. And this is not such a great one because Jupiter is um, obviously it's it's debilitated. It's it's opposite. It's exaltation and cancer. It's not in good dignity. Um, so. The thing is, with, with planets in the first house, they're so expressive. So anytime you have a, a planet in the first house, that's going to be the expression. So like Moon is a great one, but Venus and Jupiter also really strong in the first house. And if it's in poor dignity, that does lend itself to <clears throat> artistic, especially comedy, because then you can make fun of yourself when it's in poor dignity, right? Like uh, Lucille Ball has Moon and Capricorn in the first house. That moon really comes through. The poor dignity comes through. She's always making fun of herself. Lucille Ball's whole career is just like her laughing at herself. And we're laughing at her laughing at herself, right? She does these faces, and that's the moon, but it's in poor dignity. She's making fun of herself, right? It's self-deprecating humor. It's slapstick. Same thing with John Belushi. Poor dignity, Jupiter, and Venus. But <clears throat> it's in conjunct Pluto in the eighth house. And that's a very, Pluto and Leo, that's a very destructive, um, in conjunct because this Pluto in the eighth house um, in Leo just is is so deep and intense, brings in uh, very destructive behaviors. We know that he died young, whether it's food or alcohol or drugs or whatever, sex. I don't know his personal details. I know just I just know that he was very destructive. Also, he's got a square from Neptune to Venus, so his, his indulgences were very. Um, you know, not very um, clean or, or healthy, you'd say. Um, we also have Sun in conjunct Saturn. Um, this one actually is not as bad because Sun's in Aquarius and Saturn rules Aquarius. So um, that is okay, but there's still going to be a lot of tension there uh, between his, his, his discipline and his ego, right? Saturn rules your self-control. Um, so he's either going to be a hard ass or he's going to be um, his expressive self because this is first, second house. So this is relating to his expression and his speech. So if he's being an actor, if he's on stage, if he's performing, if he's speaking, that's detracting from this Saturn, right? Which is his discipline. So he's going to be more, much more indulgent um, and destructive. And second house also deals with food. We know he was overweight. Um, so yeah, and, and that's actually his ascendant lord, his body, right? Saturn's ruling the ascendant. So it's detracting also from his body. So poor health, we can see as well from that. Because, the, the you know, you look to health from the 
the, the ascendant, ascendant lord, you know, first house, as well as the sixth house, the sixth lord. So, um, you know, sixth house, you can see Uranus, um, Mercury, Mars. So, in the second, uh, so definitely food issues. Mars here, Mars can make it more prone towards uh, physical excesses and desires and whatnot. Um, yeah, so definitely a lot of difficulty here. Certainly a lot of expression, very creative. Moon and Sag in the 12th, highly creative, highly expressive, you know, very funny, slapstick, can easily make fun of himself, um, but very destructive tendencies as well. All right. Um, that was the last example. Uh, I don't want to make this too long, but I think I, I covered enough examples, both good and bad, about the inconjunct and what it really shows this, this, this unequal relationships. The other thing I, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, which applies to everyone with inconjunct, is that inconjuncts will play out in real life, in your relationships. People with uh, a strong inconjunct or more than one inconjunct will have relationships where they're imbalanced, where you're either playing a dominating role or a submissive role, or it can switch. But these are unequal relationships. If you have oppositions, you'll also have equal relationships. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, you can still have relationships if you don't have either. But definitely, if you have an inconjunct, um, you will have your relationships will tend in some ways towards imbalance. It doesn't matter. Uh, and th this doesn't mean necess necessarily romantic relationships. It could just be like a really like you always have a relationship with a boss. You always have a boss, right? always have a boss and your boss is always a pain in your butt, right? Or you are a boss and you have employees and you have to look after people and you know you have to take control of the situation. You have to be in charge and you know they're your underlings. Or it can be both, right? You, maybe you're in the middle of the road where you have a boss, but you also have people underneath you. But it could also be romantic relationships where you have the, the relationships that are just in balance, right? Like either you're in control or they're in control or it changes or it shifts or it's both at the same time in different ways, right? But it's not equal. It's not balanced. So all of these different kinds of relationships are going to play out in real life as well as internal, right? It goes both ways. So that's the in conjunct. It has to do with unequal relationships. And it has to do with seesaws of power, where power goes to one side over another, right? And it can switch, but it's a seesaw kind of event. So that's the in conjunct. Um, you know, I'd be curious to see if, um, to know if um, there are other explanations out there that, that are better than mine. I've heard ones that are not quite as clear as mine. Um, but I've not heard it put quite this way. And it took me a while to figure it out, but <clears throat> that's what I like to do with astrology. I don't just take what, like the, the whole thing where um, uh, oppositions are Saturnian, that's nonsense. They're Libra. Oppositions are Libra. They're not Saturnian. Like that's, I don't care how old it is. Like just because something's old doesn't make it right. People were idiots, you know, a thousand years ago, just as much as they are today. So just because somebody wrote it down a thousand years ago, does not make it any more true than somebody writing it down right now, right? So you have to take, it's very important to, to, to just rationalize in your brain because otherwise we just get this, this kind of sickness, this dogma where, oh, this book's a thousand years old and it's on astrology, therefore it must be correct, whatever it is, right? Who cares if it's a thousand years? Who cares if it's 10,000 years old? It doesn't make it right. Like we really have to, to nail that down. Just because something's old, just because a million people have copied it doesn't make it right. Then again, uh, there are certain things that are right and they are old, right? I mean, you know, you have to be honest. You have to tell the truth. There are many things that, you know, any case, I just want to put that out there. All right. I think that's enough for now. Um, I hope you enjoy this and I will see you guys again soon. I'm putting my book project on hold because... I realized I just don't feel it's not, um, I was like excited about like the whole chat GPT thing, but then I'm like, 
this feels so inauthentic. I just can't put my name on it. I'm not going to, you know, if I'm not going to bother to write, like, yeah, people are going to write books for ChatGPT, but I just don't want to, I don't, I just didn't feel good about it. So, you know, even though I'm lazy, even though I have sunken junk Venus, you know, the, and again, that, that maybe it has to do with the in conjunct. You know, my sun conjunct Venus wants to be lazy, but my North Node Scorpio is like, no, you got to be real, you know? Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm not putting it out a book right now. Uh, not unless I can write it myself. And I'm just, I don't have the desire to do that. So no books for now. Uh, no more books in any case. So, all right. Uh, I will see you guys again soon. Thank you. Goodbye.